Okay, good day everybody. It's 2 p.m. in Toronto. I'm Anna Blockin, Director of the Continuing Professional Development of the University of Toronto, and I'm thrilled to announce our new community of interest in gene to urinary pathology. Thank you. We have so many participants and we actually have about 100 registrants today. My huge acknowledgement goes to my colleague at the University of Toronto, Dr. Rola Solip, who uh, actually did all the work behind the scenes. And I want to give her a round of applause for this uh, event. Rola received her medical degree from the uh, University of Cairo. She completed a combined anatomical pathology postgraduate training and PhD training at the University of Toronto. She has completed the one year transformative pathology molecular fellowship granted by the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. Dr. Salib's research focuses gentle urinary pathology and kidney cancer. Her focus is translational research in fields of molecular pathology and genital urinary pathology. We have an outstanding guest today, Dr. Kirill Tripkov. I think he doesn't need any introduction, and even me being far removed from the uh, genital urinary pathology, I know uh, all the accomplishments that Dr. Tripkov did to the field of genital urinary pathology. He's a professor of pathology at the University of Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He's an academic pathologist and genital urinary pathologist group leader at the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. He's also a consultant for the Southwestern Southern Alberta Institute of Urology and Tom Baker Cancer Center in Calgary, Canada. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, and he's certified with the American Board of Pathology. He established anatomical pathology laboratory at the Rocky View General Hospital in Calgary, Alberta, as one of the largest centralized Europe pathology centers in Canada and North America, has published over 150 peer-reviewed articles, numerous book chapters, and other scholarly contributions. Dr. Tripkov has given lectures, courses, slide seminars, and workshops in your pathology on all continents. And actually, if you put his name on Google, you will come up with exceptional accomplishments that Dr. Tipkov did to the field of genital urinary pathology. A few housekeeping items before we start. All our events are recorded and they are credited by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. You'll have uh, to fill out your evaluation form in order to get the CME credit, which will be available to you at the end of the uh, February. Uh, we ask you to keep all your presentations um, within 10 minutes to allow enough time for discussion. I know that we discussed with Rolo, if uh, you go um, above 10 minutes, you might hear an alarm or nice music to stop and consider that you are going beyond that time. I think without further ado, we can start and Rolo, the floor is yours. And again, thank you so, so much for make this event happen. Uh, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Rola, for your kind uh, invitation and uh, nice presentation. I'm thrilled to see so many people join today, and I just want to start by saying hello to everyone, people that I haven't seen, and I would just start with a message, hold on. We are going to get through this. We are going to get live meetings as well as this kind of meetings, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, in, in person. Uh, a housekeeping item from me, I was told to have my presentations a little bit longer, so please don't play the music because I won't stop after 10 minutes. I have two cases to present and we'll kick off the session with a prostate case that I've, uh, I've seen recently. So I'll share my screen now and I'll start with my presentation. So I hope uh, everybody can uh, see this presentation. Uh, I practiced for almost 20 years in Calgary in a centralized uropath setting, as mentioned, and we have an annual, annual volume of about 2,000 prostate biopsies in-house, plus about 400 to 500 radical prostatectomies. And pathology is a discipline where, you know, you can never learn enough and you will never know everything. So I just want to share with you one case that... Uh, I saw recently and that uh, I struggled with. So uh, this was a 62 year old male with relatively low PSA. There was no previous history of uh, any uh, 
prostate cancer, any other relevant disease. This was his first biopsy. There was no history of prior therapy, except a few years back, he had uh, uh, dutasteride for obstructive symptoms. And uh, this slide, and I will show you many slides, uh, actually illustrates how this looked like, small nests infiltrating uh, throughout the prostatic tissue. Even at this magnification, you can start picking these areas of possible uh, dystrophic calcification of degenerate cells. At higher magnification, you can see these small innocuous looking nests with these dystrophic uh, calcifications or maybe cells dropping off with these dystrophic calcifications. Uh, yet another uh, illustration of, of uh, this kind of arrangement. Uh, can you please mute your mics because somebody has uh, entered? So this illustrates, uh, you know, the, the gist of the morphology that we saw at high magnification. You can see that the cells do not look too ugly around to oval nuclei, slightly granular cytoplasm, and uh, these foci of dystrophic calcification, but surely no glandular differentiation. Here is an area that attempts to form a gland. Uh, these nests were relatively small, but here is an area where the nests were a little bit larger and more expensile and infiltrated into the stroma. Uh, here is an area with a nerve, and you can clearly see here perineural invasion as well as this larger nest with this conspicuous calcifications uh, or dystrophic calcifications rather uh, embedded within the cell proliferation. Here is a larger nest with this more conspicuous dystrophic calcification. And you can see that this is more toward the periphery of the prostate because you see a glimpse of the adipose tissue with, which typically lives outside of the prostate. And clearly here you can see pat on both sides of this uh, uh, proliferation, which uh, indicates that there is extra prostatic extension. So this is one of the things that you should always mention in your report. Uh, extra prostatic ex extension in the setting of prostate cancer is seen very rarely, typically in the setting of high grade cancer. Older patients in about two to three percent of cases should always be reported. So this is a nasty cancer with this unusual features. And I'm showing you another sort of area here that uh, uh, infiltrated into the periprostatic fat tissue. A conspicuous finding in some foci was this squamoid uh, differentiation, which is clearly seen here in the center of the field and to the left, as well as in some other areas. This was not diffusely present, but there were distinct areas of squamoid differentiation. And here is a clear evidence of squamous differentiation. And even at this magnification, you can appreciate the presence of basal cells at the periphery. So one can even um, apply intraductal proliferation to describe such a proliferation. Here is another area showing similar features of that intraductal like pattern uh, with uh, along with dystrophic calcification. If you see something like this on a needle core biopsy, you would definitely jump immediately and label it as uh, grade group five. Much to my dismay, as I was trying to work up this case, uh, I saw that everything that uh, uh, was neoplastic, was labeling for cytokeratin 5-6. Uh, cytokeratin 5-6 is a basal keratin, and for many years we have used cytokeratin 5-6 as, as our main stay, stay, in, uh, stay basal marker, and it works beautifully. So you can use 34-beta, P63, whatever you use and does the trick for you, it's fine. However, you know, now we have a problem because cytokeratin 5-6 was diffusely positive. Uh, here is another area where we use 34-beta, hoping that we'll have a different result. Nevertheless, you can see that 34-beta stained most of the neoplastic areas. However, in some areas, there was loss of basal keratin. So there was somewhat uh, variable result for 34-beta, but most of the cancer was staining for cytokeratin 5-6. Yet we used another basal marker instead of P63. You can even use P40, and you can see very convincing positivity for P40 in some of these neoplastic nests. Some of the nests were negative. Uh, again, another area with P40 showing convincing positivity. Okay, if you are in the prostate and you're struggling, 
NKX 3.1 is a specific marker that uh, we use in our practice. PSMA is used in some labs. Whichever one you use, it gives you a confidence that you're dealing with prostate cancer. So here is NKX 3.1, as you can see, dead negative. Now, how do we interpret and how do we uh, put together the immunos and the morphologies that I showed you initially? Here is just a remnant of NKX 3.1 uh, staining some of the secretory cells, which indicates that, yes, indeed, NKX 3.1 has worked and it's not a fluke or technical artifact in our lab. With this morphology, you definitely have to introduce the possibility that this may rep represent uh, urothelial cancer, urothelial cancer with basaloid phenotype. Um, and that's why we did GATA3. As you can see, GATA3 was uh, clearly uh, dead negative in some areas. In some areas, there was focal patchy positivity for GATA3. Nevertheless, most of the neoplasm was completely negative for GATA3. And here is an area with perineural invasion captured with high magnification. You can see a small nerve tweak with cells surrounding uh, the nerve and NKX 3.1 negative, 34 uh, cytokeratin 5.6 was strongly positive. Racemase, I didn't mention it. It was mostly negative throughout uh, the whole uh, cancer. And here is 34 beta, again, in the same uh, focus demonstrating strong positivity as well as P40. So you have a differential diagnosis where you start sort of thinking about this kind of case and how to sign it. Adenosquamous prostate cancer comes to mind. Unfortunately, there is no adeno component, so this goes into the sink. I've mentioned urothelial carcinoma, but there is, um, at the time when I was looking at the biopsy, there was no info or evidence of urethral or bladder mass. Although, as I've mentioned, this IHC profile may be compatible. Although it's got a three negative, those kind of cancers that typically demonstrate basal keratin with squamoid basaloid phenotype now recognized as basaloid uh, muscle invasive urothelial car carcinomas can have this kind of uh, sign out. So I planned to um, share that information with the clinician to explore this further. Then you're left with basal or basaloid carcinoma of the prostate. And typically I will show you in, in, in some of the, uh, the, the coming slides how this has been dealt with in the literature in the past. Uh, basal cell pattern is one of the patterns, the, one of the commonest patterns of this carcinoma with large uh, nests, small or large nests. If you see central necrosis, that's a bad prognosticator. And usually they demonstrate peripheral cell palisading. The other pattern uh, that was described under this category of basal, basal carcinoma is so-called adenoid cystic pattern. And I'll illustrate this. We didn't see essentially uh, adenoid cystic or uh, anything along those lines. So I was leaning towards signing this as basal, basaloid with some squamous differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm showing you here some additional markers that we did, both PSA and PSAP were negative. ERG was also negative, uh, seven was positive, 20 was negative, BCL2 was focally positive and K67 proliferation marker was limited to about uh, one to two percent of the cells. But this cancer does not really fit any of these uh, categories that I've outlined. So I struggled with this case. And what do you do when you struggle? You, you share it with your colleagues who you hope, you know, may have seen a case like this. And I shared images from this uh, case with uh, several colleagues, genitourinary pathologists. And those are the, the things that everybody sort of uh, mentioned and ultimately we honed into this basal, basaloid phenotype, basal carcinoma, or carcinoma demonstrating basal uh, phenotype with uh, focal squamous differentiation. Just to illustrate the adenoid cystic pattern uh, that is typically described, and some people uh, describe this as a separate entity, some people lump them under this basal, basaloid category. And when I talk about this, you should be aware that this is an exceptionally rare finding. Like I've seen maybe a couple of cases prior to this of my more than 20 years of practice. And even if you go and read the literature, you will see that these cases are very rare and even uh, has been assembled in multi-institutional cohorts from experts and only several cases have been described. 
But adenoid cystic pattern is one of those patterns. And definitely everybody emphasizes that definitely if you see invasion into periprostatic fat or perineural invasion, those are definite criteria for malignancy. The other pattern uh, that was described is this large nest. And in particular here, I'm illustrating one uh, uh, photo from, from an old paper from Dr. Epstein, uh, central necrosis. And uh, he has associated this feature in his paper from many years ago with adverse behavior. Obviously, some of these have been indolent, some of these have been aggressive, but there was no clear cut uh, evidence as to which one uh, will behave aggressively. I will show you some additional patterns that have been demonstrated in the literature and shown to be part of the morphologic picture of these uh, types of cases. Here is a small nested infiltrative pattern where you clearly see infiltration in between the uh, benign glands. Here is a trabecular. Some people have emphasized uh, if you see uh, uh, fusion or elongation or uh, complex trabecular uh, arrangement that that might be associated with worse behavior. But you know that the number of cases is so small that uh, firm conclusions cannot be drawn. Here is uh, an example of one case that I saw many years ago uh, where I saw extensive basaloid and squamous differentiation. Most of these cases have been documented on TERP because they originate primarily in the transitional zone. However, some cases have been documented also on middle core biopsy. This was obviously a case documented on TERP. And on the right-hand side, you can see this large confluent nested and trabecular pattern. And often you struggle to say, OK, is this a typical basal cell hyperplasia? How much can I justify under the rubric of basal cell hyperplasia? And I'll show you some of the differential uh, uh, features in terms of basal cell hyperplasia that you should be aware of. So definite evidence of extraprostatic extension, basaloid uh, differentiation, plus um, uh, perineural invasion and necrosis should be considered uh, uh, features that are worrisome and potentially may indicate more aggressive behavior of this tumor. Uh, I should also mention that in the literature you have cases of this aberrant diffuse expression of p63 in some small acinar cancers this is not the thing that we are talking about these small acinar cancers if you're using p63 you may see it in some cases they are negative for high molecular weight keratin this was described some years ago by dr brimo from uh, now in montreal at mcgill when he was a fellow with dr epstein i don't use p63 i've never seen this phenomenon with cytokeratin 5-6, but you should be aware. Again, just uh, to emphasize uh, other aspects of the discussion on immunohistochemistry, when you may be surprised with immunohistochemistry. So if you have P63, make sure that other markers are negative so that uh, you, you rule out this possibility. So my final diagnosis here was prostatic carcinoma with basal features and squamous differentiation. Obviously, this is a case that, you know, I couldn't reconcile with anything that I found in the literature, which was a very unusual case. And I felt that uh, grading Gleason score is not applicable to this case. I labeled it, though, as high-grade carcinoma because there were many adverse features that were present. Extensive core involvement, 15 of 15 cores were involved. About two-thirds of all core tissue was involved. There was extensive perineural invasion, as I've illustrated, and there was periprostatic fat invasion. Uh, uh, obvious in, in the needle core biopsy. However, I also emphasize the need to rule out urothelial carcinoma, the urethral or bladder primary, so that, you know, we don't get caught our, ourselves, you know, not considering that this may be coming from outside of the prostate. And that was actually done. They, they did MRI after that, and th there was a clearly uh, prostate-based mass, which was replacing most of the prostate, and it was irregularly uh, uh, marginated, and it was clearly infiltrating into both seminal vesicles, predominantly on the left side, and it was also infiltrating into the bladder wall. So I was hoping that we will see at the time when I was signing out this case, the whole radical prostatectomy, but you can see the extent of the, of the uh, cancer uh, involvement of the adjacent organs precluded that, and uh, this was done, uh, this biopsy I've seen several months ago, 
uh, the latest follow-up on this patient is that he's treated with external beam uh, uh, radiotherapy along with androgen hormone, although many of these basal markers, uh, uh, many of these androgen uh, basal cell cancers have been shown not to be androgen receptor uh, expressing. Uh, here is the MRI of the prostatic base. You can see clearly that there is infiltration into the seminal vesicle and into the wall of the bladder. So this was a nasty cancer, unusual cancer that I wanted to share with you because I have not seen a case like this and to discuss the spectrum of these unusual rare cases of basal cell hyperplasia. And I'd like just a few minutes more to share with you a few words about the differential diagnosis and some important grading issues in prostate cancer. The most common uh, differential diagnosis in this scenario is basal cell hyperplasia, a common mimicker of prostate cancer that can demonstrate small acinar or solid infiltrative pattern as seen here, often with very prominent eosinophilic secretions and calcifications. And I will emphasize some of the unusual features of basal cell hyperplasia that uh, people should be aware of. Uh, so this is one example. Typically, it's not a problem to recognize basal cell hyperplasia unless it's uh, uh, very extensive and it's uh, bothersome for, you know, representing this rare variant of basal cell carcinoma. And do those kind of cases, when you have a TERP with extensive proliferation like this, you should very carefully, uh, completely sample them and very carefully evaluate them. They clearly demonstrate strong uh, uh, basal cell marker expression, but you often don't need to do this. There is one uh, pattern of basal cell uh, hyperplasia where basal cells are not as prominent, but you have these very dense luminal secretions, and this is one of the phases of basal cell hyperplasia that is a little bit unusual. Here is an example of needle core biopsy that demonstrate a cribriform, or some people label it a pseudocribriform pattern, even blue mucin. And this is an example of basal cell hyperplasia with cribriform slash pseudocribriform pattern. Here is one additional example. And just be aware that uh, um, uh, these patterns may also be uh, part of the morphologic, not as common, uh, but part of the morphologic picture of basal cell hyperplasia, this cribriform pattern. So basal cell hyperplasia has various patterns, uh, typically demonstrate this basaloid eccentric or centrifugal uh, proliferation of cells. And I usually describe these when I talk with my residents as nuclei that basically don't respect each other. They're like in a mosh pit and they're jumping on top of each other. Not a lot of cytoplasm. You may see nucleoli, do not mix it up with uh, high, high grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. A prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia typically proliferates toward the lumen. Basal cell hyperplasia typically proliferates toward the periphery. But you may, may have this infiltrative acinar cribriform from solid pattern that sometimes may throw you off on TERP or on needle core biopsy. Uh, I've uh, also illustrated these lamellar calcifications, dense, dense hyaline globules and blue mucin that you may see, and uh, the features of prominent nucleoli and rare mitosis that can be seen However, typically you don't see perineural invasion and extra prostatic extension. You don't need to do immunos. If you're sometimes, you know, wondering about whether this is some uh, an unusual morphologic pattern of basal cell hyperplasia, it will demonstrate the typical features of basal cells with high molecular weight uh, keratin strongly positive, racemase negative. Uh, a few uh, points because I've mentioned that this. Uh, type of cancer should not be graded. I sh should emphasize here and clarify for the people for the sake of uh, some uh, teaching points that some variants or patterns of prostate cancer should be graded. So if you have pseudohyperplastic, some of these deceptive patterns of prostate cancer, the general rule is you see individual glands, it's three. As long as you can draw circles, variation in size and shape do not matter, but individual units should be graded three. Pseudocyperplastic is typically three. Foamy gland cancer, again, generally three. If they're starting to fuse, you can consider glisten pattern four. If you have mucinous background, you forget the mucin, you look at uh, the glands up front. If they're individual, glisten pattern three, as some of these individual glands would be graded. If they're fusing, glisten pattern four. Atrophic pattern, 
here is a collagenous micronodule, pathognomonic feature of prostate cancer. They're typically Gleason pattern three. Ductal carcinoma is typically Gleason pattern four or Gleason pattern five. If you have uh, necrosis pin-like, if you have too much of something that looks like pin through high molecular weight keratin, uh, sometimes they demonstrate uh, pseudopapillary pattern, typically without any fibrovascular cores, not, not the presence of fibrovascular cores in ductal carcinoma, they're typically three or four, and microcystic is typically three. Collagenous nodules, the same rule applies as for the mucinous pattern. You forget uh, the mucin or you forget the collagenous nodules. So you look at the background glands. If they're individual, there are three. If they're fused, there are four. Intraductal carcinoma, I don't grade it. I mention it because it's a feature that's associated with worse prognosis. Uh, it typically doesn't make much difference because it is associated with high-grade patterns, uh, cancer, glycine pattern four or three. If it's with glycine pattern uh, four or five, if it's associated with glycine pattern three, then it may signify worse prognosis, which will change, but you should clearly communicate to the clinicians how you derived uh, the glycine grade in that scenario and signaturing carcinoma, which is bonified prostatic carcinoma should be graded at glycine pattern five. You sh should grade even minute foci of cancer. And if you're not sure how to grade them, always go down. Don't always, don't go four or five. The default should be lower grade glycine pattern three, particularly if you have squished small glands at the edges of the course. One other point that I always emphasize, be careful when you're uh, estimating the pattern for, particularly when there is a limited volume of prostate cancer, you have one or two cores with about 10% involvement and then with prostate cancer, and then you're tempted to say there is pattern four and out of that one millimeter, you say, oh, there is 40% pattern four. I typically say uh, I don't provide uh, percent pattern for in that scenario. And I say uh, the limited amount of carcinoma uh, is sufficient to report and reporting percent pattern for in this scenario when there is a limited cancer needle core biopsy may be misleading and potentially incorrect. And as we've mentioned, some uh, uh, unusual patterns uh, such as the ones the one that I've just shared with you, including basaloid or adenoid cystic should not be graded as well as small cell neuroendocrine squamous or adenosquamous carcinoma. These are typically occurring after some previous treatment or urothelial carcinoma. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. And I hope uh, I can answer any questions if you have them. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, Carol. Um... Thank you, Dr. Turpin. This is, was such a, such a difficult case. Um, I, I will start with a question uh, on my own. So um, I think the biggest pitfall for me was to not call this uh, a, a great group five and, and be done with it. Um, I, I would ask you like, in your opinion, what's the biggest clue? Like I, I felt the cytology was a bit off. Maybe you had a, a bit of basaloid look. Um, what I do you agree think with, with you. Yeah. I, I would have signed it as Gleason pattern five, actually, uh, and I dictated it as, as Gleason pattern five, but I did. Uh, the, the presence of those calcifications was a little bit unusual. The extent of cancer was a little bit unusual, uh, so that I wanted to make sure that I'm not uh, overlooking urothelial cancer on something else. And that's why I did high molecular weight keratin. To be honest with you, I was completely surprised and taken aback by the extent of uh, high molecular weight positivity. I mean, this is probably, if I've seen one case like this, it's probably a very rare case. I just wanna bring it to, to people's attentions and it's not only necessary because it is a rare and unusual case, but to consider the consequences and implications and the differential diagnosis that comes uh, with, uh, with such a case where you consider whether this may be basaloid carcinoma, basal carcinoma, a, a topic that nobody is an expert on because nobody had seen enough cases of it. Um, I, I think Dr. Evans has the same up. Yeah. I think you're muted. Hi, Carol. Oh, nice yeah. to see you. Hi, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Nice to see you. So great case. Um, one of the, just a couple of things that um, I was thinking about as I go through these, I've seen um, uh, a couple of examples over the course of my career 
of um, adenal squamous carcinomas uh, that have been uh, detected in prostate core biopsies in patients who had pelvic radiation for some other cause. So just that said, if I saw, particularly when you showed that area with the squamous differentiation, I'd start thinking adenosquame, the first place I'm going to go is to the chart, what else mm -hmm. is happening with the patient. But in your case, the treatment came after. So <laughs> it wasn't the radiation came after you made the diagnosis. And then the other thing too, is when you showed the GATA3, um, it's been my experience, GATA3 is a lovely marker of basal cells. And I think you were, the focal data three you were showing there is probably some, some basal cells with that introduction right. process there. But uh, wow, what a case. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, no, I agree with, with your remarks, Andy. It was, it was an unusual case. And, uh, you know, I emphasized initially that the only history, because that was the first thing to go uh, and check the, the, the history of any previous uh, uh, treatment. He only had the tasterite uh, because he had enlargement um, of the gland and some urinary symptoms a few years before that, but no uh, prior document prostate cancer with some treatment, either hormonal or radiation, because that's the typical scenario that you've mentioned where you see squamous cell carcinoma. And I've seen few typically in that kind of scenario, you first have acinar type cancer, some treatment, and then you have this unusual uh, either squamous or even sarcomatoid or all sorts of things, neuroendocrine, but treatment usually seems to um, lead toward the clonal progression of some of these unusual clones that morphologically do not look like the original acinar type cancer. Um, we have one question in the chat. Um, Dr. Carroll, do you use alone P63 or another biomarker for myoepithelial cells? Uh, there are no myoepithelial <laughs> cells in the prostate. There are only basal cells. And I, I, I use only cytokeratin 5-6, and I may be one of the outliers. Um, I've had great experience over many years. It's a great marker. It works for me and for my lab, but I, it's not the only marker, as I've mentioned. You can use 34-beta. The problem with 34-beta is, as, as it's well recognized even 20, 30 years ago, um, fixation can interfere with the expression of 34 beta with P63, same thing. Also, there were some papers indicating that if you just uh, leave the slides for a while and then do P63, after a few months, it's going to be very weak or negative. The other pitfall with P63 is what I've just shown in my presentation. There are some cancers that are small as you know, that are P63 and usually uh, and, and, and uh, strikingly positive 34 beta is negative. Uh, so P40, I don't use it. I used it here just to make sure that I'm not missing something. People use cocktails, whatever you use, if you're happy with it, stay with it. If you're not, just do uh, try something else. So th that's something else for us was cytokeratin 5-6 and I, I use it routinely. And we use it as a sequential staining. First, we uh, stain cytokeratin 5-6 with brown chromogen and then racemase with red chromogen on the same slide so that you have one slide to evaluate. I mean, this was, we have, we have done this and, and, and published many, many years ago. As, but as I mentioned, they're cocktails, whatever works for you, as long as you're happy and, and, and you're getting good results to support your diagnosis. A, make your diagnosis on morphology and B, use immunohistochemistry judiciously and use it only when you need to support the diagnosis. In my practice, I've found that um, lately I'm using much less immunohistochemistry and everybody is aware of these fiscal constraints that we operate, not only in the first world, but in any world. And I would uh, recommend that people follow the um, recommendations put forth in the past, for instance, by ISAP, if you have five or six clearly positive cores, what's the point of chasing a seventh microfocus in a seventh core? Uh, if it's cancer, just label it atypical, suspicious, cannot rule out prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera. If it changes the, the treatment, then you should pursue it with immunohistochemistry, but not right off the bat. Um, so we don't have any more questions for this case. So I'll move on to the next case. Uh, next case is presented by Dr. Adriana Krizova, my colleague at Unity Health Toronto, the St. Michael's Hospital site. Um, Adriana, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, I'll share my screen. I, I have your uh, presentation. Okay. 
Let me see. Um, here. Okay. Okay, the presentation is on, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rola. And uh, I apologize, everyone. I put it all in uh, in one slide. I'm, uh, I'm driving, so I just wanted to have it all in in one spot. And it's it's a it's a short and uh, a sweet case. I called it a fully recognized bacterial <laughs> neoplasm that can stimulate the angiosarcoma. So we have a 64 year old male that was uh, investigated uh, for an un unexplained weight loss, and then imaging they found a uh, perirenal mass. The only history or past medical history was hypertension. And MRI reported a complex retroperitoneal cystic mass that slayed the renal artery and vein, and uh, there was no uh, vascular invasion. And the radiologist thought uh, that this, this, the differential is wide. It could be a mass, it could be a neurogenic tumor, it could be sarcoma or a lymphoma. So when we got it on gross, it was a uh, ovoid, well-circumscribed mass, maximum dimension two and a half centimeters, and there was a partial capsule. So when you look at the image on the left-hand side, the low power, you can see that there is a portion of the tumor. You probably don't see it on this power, but there was a portion with the edema and degenerative changes. And the more kind of cellular areas where the cells were viable, I just highlighted on the images on the right-hand side. So, uh, and uh, the arrows point to where I took the snapshots uh, from. So we had these uh, capillary sized channels with uh, fibrin thrombi, the endothelial cells were bland. They were really minimal ATPI, no really mitosis. And uh, there was occasional nuclear hobnailing. Uh, when uh, you know, did the basic stains because when you look at it, it does it does strike you as a as a hemangioma. You just wonder, well, it's perirenal. What what is it doing there? Uh, I did CD31 and CD34, 31, 34, both positive. HMB45, just to kind of uh, I think of the kidney tumors was the negative is at the bottom of the of the left as a as a low power. And when you look at the, look at the literature. Uh, and then it's, a, it's a small number of cases that are reported as, uh, as um, um, anastomosing uh, hemangioma. It seems to be a uh, usually incidentally found uh, found tumor either in the kidney or in the hilum, perirenal mass around the, around the testes. Uh, it has these overlapping features with uh, hobnail and sinusoidal, sinusoidal hemangioma of uh, soft tissues and skin, and when you look at the case reports and the, the, the tiny case series that are in the literature, it's, um, it's, uh, you, the, these tumors usually show only minor extension into adipose tissue, classically this anastomosing sinusoidal capillary sized vessels, and that's what sometimes uh, prompts uh, uh, pathologists to refer this to exclude an angiosarcoma. But uh, there's no cellular atypia, really no mitosis. There is no kind of uh, multilayering of uh, endothelial cells. So apparently, classical features are the vascular thrombi, and we have some, uh, some thrombi in the right hand side, right -hand side uh, image. And you can see foci of mixed inflammation or only lymphocytic plasmacytic inflammation. You can, you can also see uh, extra major hematopoiesis and higher line globules. So this was a case of a uh, anastomosing uh, hemangioma of uh, uh, genital urinary kind of tract, and this was a uh, peridinoma. Um, I would just like to to point uh, this case. I, it's not that uncommon. Like, I've seen it in our institution about three times in the past five years, and it can be really confusing on imaging. Um, and it's particularly uh, when you get a biopsy and you don't really know what you're looking for, and you have a few vascular channels, and you're thinking is that just connective tissue with a with a bit of an a, a extra vascularity to it, or um, and so I've seen this three times, and the clinicians that now kind of know how it looks by imaging. And then they, when they suspect a case, I had a case recently where biopsy didn't really give me a clue much, but, but the imaging, but the clinicians alerted me and it was actually um, th this entity. Yeah, I've seen few of these and it's important to recognize them as benign tumors. They're typically in the pararenal 
location, either at the periphery or in the hilum. Sometimes you may even see a glomus tumor or glomangiomas that looks in, in a similar fashion, but it's important to recognize them uh, as benign in their uh, few small series from, from some larger institutions uh, describing the spectrum of these vascular tumors that arise in the renal slash pararenal uh, location, because I'm not sure that some of the cases that I have seen are really renal. They're probably arising in the hilum, is I, I think uh, your cases may, may have been. Yeah. yeah, I agree. They can be actually, the, the, the pararenal, perarenal case, soft tissue masses can be very confusing. I agree. Um, I would, a great uh, presentation on a single slide, Laconica. Yeah, I know. That's a that's a great feat to to show everything in one slide, not as me. Excellent. <laughs> I like that. Um, I, I would move on to the next presenter. That would be Dr. Michelle Downs, uh, who's the division head of pathology at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. Um, so, uh, and go ahead, Michelle. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the very kind invitation to participate today, Roller, for this inaugural GU Community of Interest. It's, it's very exciting that we have a GU one. I know there have been some breast and gynae ones in the past. So I'm going to try and screen share and hopefully not mess this up. So can everyone see my screen and my pointer moving? Yes? Yes. Okay, all right. So we're going to get started. So we're switching gears. And we're going to talk about a testicular case. Um, I will not be discussing any... Um, I will not be discussing any off-label uh, indications, and I don't have any relevant financial disclosures that pertain to this particular talk. So the case history is a little bit unusual. This was a 30-year-old man who was referred down to see a urologist at Sunnybrook, but he had been seen for the two years prior uh, by a urologist up north. It's not clear to me from the notes why exactly he ended up being referred down. Anyway, this external urologist had seen him over two years with a history of a left testicular mass and had performed several ultrasounds at that institution, uh, all of which showed a 1.2 centimeter mass in the left upper pole. There was an incidental left varicose seal uh, it was a hypoechoic mass and there was nothing of note in the right testicle. There was no history of cryptorchidism. There was no family history that was relevant. And this patient was otherwise well. He had no preceding medical history and was not on any medication. So he was examined by the urologist down here at Sunnybrook who could feel a palpable mass in the upper pole of the left testis. And otherwise the rest of the examination was non-contributory. So the abdomen was soft and non-tender uh, and there was no adenopathy that was palpable um, at the time. Uh, again, tumor markers were actually performed at the original institution, not in our institution, so we only had the information that was available in the referral letter, but it looks like the tumor markers that were performed at least twice over the preceding two-year period were normal, so the AFP was given as three, the HCG was less than one, and the LDH was recorded as normal. Um, no CT abdomen was performed uh, on this patient. I'm not sure if that was just because they felt the tumor markers were normal. So it was decided at his consultation here at Sunnybrook that they would proceed to do an exploration plus minus orchiectomy in the patient requested insertion of a prosthesis. So intraoperatively, uh, the urologist could palpate what he felt was approximately a two centimeter mass in the upper pole of the left testis. He felt it was abutting the epididymis uh, and was concerned, so he proceeded to a radical orchiectomy. So on gross examination, indeed, there was a lesion in the upper pole um, at the time of grossing, and unfortunately, I don't have an image. Um, it was said to be in the parenchyma of the testis. It measured 1.5 centimeters maximally. Um, it was a well-defined tan solid lesion uh, that was abutting the reti testis and not grossly involving uh, the tunica albuginia vaginalis or epididymis. Uh, it was a single lesion, so unifocal, and the rest of the parenchyma appeared normal. So these are a couple of low power images. Um, so what I'm trying to show here is it was a very pink lesion, I guess, on low power. And you can see that it seems to be, uh, while it appeared somewhat circumscribed, um, it's not encapsulated. And in fact, it seems to be infiltrating here into the seminiferous tubules. You can see a couple of tubules out here that uh, appear quite atrophic on low power. It was also present um, splaying out the epithelium of the red A testis. And if we go to 
a slightly higher power. Uh, so this image here is to show that the epithelial component of the red A testis is normal. And in fact, the lesional um, the lesional stuff is in between. It seems to be here in the stroma. Um, it's a very pink lesion, and there's certainly the appearance that there's some collagenization or hyalinization also. Uh, and when we go to slightly higher power, you can see scattering of lymphocytes and also some small uh, lymphoid aggregates. So if we go down on higher power again, you can appreciate that hyalinized appearance to the stroma, and we can see it is indeed a, a pink or eosinophilic appearing tumor. And architecturally, it is arranged in these cords or trabeculae. Uh, we have a moderate amount of pink eosinophilic cytoplasm, and certainly even at this power, it does not appear very atypical. If you go to a higher power again, you can appreciate there's some vacuolation here in the cytoplasm. The nuclei again do not appear pleomorphic. And if we go to a higher power again, we can see there's small pinpoint nucleoli and again, little aggregates of lymphocytes around the place. So these two low power images are to show you that this lesion was extending up towards what appeared to be the edge of the section and seemed to be merging, I guess, somewhat imperceptibly. Again, lots of little lymphoid aggregates, particularly notable around the periphery of the lesion. And again, on this low power image here, we can see we have some seminiferous tubules, a little bit of epididymis. And indeed, it does appear to be a butting, but not involving, um, as was the impression at the time of the gross examination. And again, and some more lymphoid aggregates out here. Of course, no examination of the testis would be complete without checking the background parenchyma. And we can see here the seminiferous tubules appear to be quite normal. There's active spermatogenesis, and certainly there was no uh, histologic evidence on the H&E of germ cell neoplasia in situ. And again, we can see this eosinophilic uh, lesion sort of making its way and splaying out some of the seminiferous tubules here. So at this point, there was a couple of differential considerations. Obviously, with a 30-year-old male, he's sitting in the right age group for dealing with a germ cell tumor. So um, things that perhaps could have this morphologic appearance, I felt, might be seminoma or yolk sac. So seminomas can occur with a somewhat corded growth pattern, although when I see that, it's typically when it's involving the red A testis. Um, I've never seen a pure corded growth pattern. But of course, we have some uh, markers that I think most most people would have available in their labs that may be useful. Yolk sac, as we all know, is the great mimicker in um, germ cell pathology. Um, yolk sacs can have spindle cell or parietal patterns, which I guess could resemble somewhat what we saw on those H&E sections. Um, however, I've never seen a yolk sac tumor that has a normal AFP. If anything, it's usually the other way around. The AFP is elevated and you may struggle to find the yolk sac component. But of course, there are also markers that could be helpful if you want to consider that in the differential. Outside of the germ cell, then you're thinking about maybe something in the sex cord stromal, so Sertoli cell tumors. So prior to the WHO 2016 blue book, we know that there was the sclerosing Sertoli cell tumor that could have that kind of eosinophilic appearance in the background. That is now just categorized since 2016 as under the Sertoli cell NOS. But certainly the solid tubules and corded pattern could, could perhaps fit with that differential diagnosis. And of course, there are several markers we can use to assess that. So then we're interested slightly rarer entities? Could it be something sitting in the red A testis? So Sertoli form cyst adenomas, while well, the epithelium looked pretty normal, um, an adenofibroma perhaps, um, given that splayed out appearance um, where the epithelium of the red A testis was compressed. And then could it be something mesothelial? Uh, I think metastasis always has to be uh, considered with anything unusual in the testis, but um, in a 30-year-old patient, quite unlikely. So this is a summary of the IHC um, that I performed. So the lesion was pan-keratin positive, um, and it showed expression of calretinin and WT1. Um, specifically, the OCT4 was negative, and inhibin, MELA, synaptophyse, and SF1 were all negative as well. So in retrospect, since we have um, got some newer um, markers since I've signed out this case, I did a BAP1, and the BAP1 was retained. Uh, and out of interest, I did this new marker called MTAP, which some of you may have read about in the literature. There's some interest in looking at MTAP and mesothelial proliferations. So this is just some of the positive IHC results. We can see the calretinin, the WT1 expression. BAP1 is a little bit out of focus. Uh, and this was this newer marker MTAP that I, I just uh, put in there for some of the IHC enthusiasts amongst you. 
So if we just take a quick look back at the differential diagnosis, it's not a corded growth pattern of seminoma. Obviously, it was an OCT4 negative tumor. Our Satoli cell tumor markers, the inhibin, the melanin, the SF1, and the beta catenin were negative. And as we saw on the high power, this was not a, a stromal lesion. There was an epithelial component to this as well. So not an adenofibroma of the red A testis. So uh, I ended up signing this case out as an adenomatoid tumor that had some intratesticular growth. Um, we're more familiar with this as being a paratesticular uh, pathology. Um, and I've included the typical appearance of what we normally see with adenomatoid tumors, which is this spider web or lace-like appearance. But you can get a, cro a corded growth pattern with very eosinophilic cells, similar to what I've put here from our case. So I think the mesothelial origin was supported by the expression of the markers, um, namely the pankeratin, our calretinin, WT1, and then the BAP one as well. So I thought I'd present this case, not that adenomatoid tumors are particularly um, difficult diagnosis, but when there's a little bit of an intratesticular growth pattern, it can be a little more challenging. Um, and I think the morphology in this case was not the usual morphology we typically expect to see with an adenomatoid tumor. Obviously, IHC is very helpful. And another thing just to bear in mind with this particular diagnosis is that sometimes adenomatoid tumors can become infarcted. And if that happens, they can be necrotic, they can have lots of mitotic figures and be very atypical looking, so not to overcall as malignant. So this patient did come for uh, two follow-up visits after his surgery. Um, his first one was his immediate post-operative visit, of which he was well, and he was seen six months later. Um, everything appeared to be fine, uh, nothing to find on examination. And at that point, he was discharged back to his own urologist up in the north of the province. Uh, and unfortunately, due to the privacy um, our privacy issues here in the province. I'm not able to go into the provincial system to determine was there any additional follow-up, but certainly he hasn't been back to Sunnybrook in the last three years. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I would have to say that I found this case very difficult when I, when I saw their presentation first. Um, <laughs> Such a tough case. The morphology is atypical. The location is atypical. It, it really just fits, though. Like, it, and it doesn't really fit anything else. But it's such such a tough case, really. Yeah, and I mean adenomatoid tumors. If you when you read about them in any of the textbooks, there's always a single line at the very bottom paragraph which says these may have uh, an intratesticular growth pattern, but it's extremely rare. And if you do a quick PubMed search. I think the largest case series was, I think, 11 or so. So, I mean, they're, they're not that common. And I have to confess, I had seen one um, a few weeks prior to this case where I was reviewing for a journal. So it was probably at the forefront of my mind, um, just serendipitously, which made things maybe a little bit easier. But I agree, certainly not the most typical morphology um, and something just to, just to think about. Sometimes... Um, usual things can present in unusual ways or slightly unusual locations. Um, and I don't think we have questions. So I will move on to the next case. So next I will present Dr. Manel Gabriel from uh, Western Ontario. Uh, Dr. Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks, Rola, for the invitation. Uh, um, excited to present this case. So can I share now? Um, share. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. You see that? Oh, OK. Yes. Uh, so this is actually uh, my case. Um, it's, it could be a simple case, but uh, uh, we see this case like uh, uh, rarely in our practice, not uh, not much. So uh, my case actually today, uh, bladder tumor. Uh, we do have uh, a 66 years old female patient came with two centimeter of sessile appearing bladder tumors on uh, cystoscopy. Uh, so uh, this is just a lower magnification here, uh, uh, just to show you as uh, the tissue we got. Uh, so fragments like like that, uh, showing some hemorrhage, some necrosis, uh, and the new plastic uh, lesion on lower magnification, as we see here. 
uh, higher magnification a little bit just to show you that we do have the cautery artifact all the time. I think this is common uh, in all bladder uh, biopsies we have. And um, we can see here some crib reform pattern of the new plastic lesion here. This is uh, necrosis, uh, again, areas of necrosis like that. Higher magnification, just to show you, we do have uh, some papillary structures like that and uh, uh, crib reform, uh, um, higher uh, um, uh, cytological atypia, as we see here. Um, same thing you can see, crib reform and uh, also uh, necrosis. And this is a, a highest magnification here, just to show you the uh, glandular crib reform with some dirty necrosis uh, in uh, uh, the abdominal uh, structures here. Um, pseudo stratification and uh, also very pleomorphic uh, kind of uh, um, atypia here um, within the new plastic uh, glands and also a uh, nuclear uh, polarity lost. So my differential diagnosis actually in this case was, uh, is it urethral carcinoma with, um, you know, predomin predominant glandular uh, differentiation, or um, maybe it's pure primary adenocarcinoma of the bladder uh, versus metastatic adenocarcinoma. We do have something like enteric uh, uh, type of, uh, like intestinal type of adenocarcinoma here. So um, primary versus metastatic, or of course, uh, you know, being it's away from this differential diagnosis like villus adenoma or florid uh, cystitis uh, cystic uh, uh, glandularis. It's away from the differential diagnosis. So we did some uh, immune markers here. So cytokeratin, of course, we have to start with cytokeratin 7 and 20. So for 20 here, you can see that it's diffusely uh, positive as we see here. And uh, cytokeratin 7 was uh, dead negative, as we see here in the crib reform areas and everywhere. Um, GATA3 also uh, negative. We don't have any uh, stains at all, nuclear staining. Uh, P63, actually, I consider this as very weak or um, negative. Uh, in uh, in the new plastic areas, uh, uh, beta catenin actually was um, something like uh, membranous and cytoplasmic, as we see here, and all the nuclei looks like negative. Um, so. Our differential diagnosis now, which one of these? Um, I think if we um, choose one of these, I should say, is it primary versus secondary adenocarcinoma? Uh, I don't have any, um, you know, inside you, like something like precursor uh, lesion as well as adenoma to consider this as, uh, um, you know, adenocarcinoma primary of the bladder. Uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma, this is by exclusion. So uh, um, if we look at this, uh, um, you know, um, a table just to uh, help us uh, to uh, differentiate between primary versus secondary adenocarcinoma of the bladder. I can see here like everything shares the same, get a three negative in primary urinary uh, bladder adenocarcinoma as well as in secondary um, one. However, it's positive in urethral carcinoma with glandular differentiation. Uh, beta catenin in here, uh, uh, kind of helpful because in primary one we should see membranous, but uh, in uh, uh, metastatic one we should have nuclear, but we don't have this in our case. Actually, we have cytoplasmic and membranous and no nuclear staining at all. So we did sign this case actually as adenocarcinoma primary versus secondary, but we favored metastatic colonic adenocarcinoma as cytokeratin 7 negative and um, we asked for clinical correlation to be suggested, and we found that there is imaging uh, confirms locally advanced colorectal cancer. So um, the case actually, it's metastatic uh, colonic adenocarcinoma rather than primary. So uh, colorectal uh, carcinoma actually metastasized to the bladder is a deceiving thing about this one. It can be discontinuous invasion. So it can be only uh, just mucosa, not from the um, uh, involving the mucosa only, not from the uh, outside to go through the muscle to the mucosa. So, and this is what we have in our case. We have just uh, bladder polyps or uh, something like polyboid lesion in the uh, 
a bladder wall. Uh, but the, uh, the other thing also difficult about colorectal carcinoma metastasis to um, bladder versus primary is the immunohistochemical studies actually not sufficient to give uh, uh, like confirm the diagnosis because there is overlap. Uh, I said that uh, beta catenin can be helpful because uh, it's nuclear in colorectal uh, cancer uh, metastasis to the bladder. However, in 19% of the cases, we have uh, uh, no nuclear um, nuclear uh, staining, just the cytoplasmic and membranous. And this is what we have in our case. Uh, the other thing here, uh, this is another case uh, showing uh, like a primary adenocarcinoma of the bladder, uh, and uh, it can look typically as the intestinal type or as enteric type of the metastatic one, uh, but it's very rare, like 2% of bladder carcinoma actually uh, can be um, adenocarcinoma. Uh, uh, here, um, cytokeratin 7 positive, cytokeratin 20 positive, and uh, beta catenin can be negative in primary one. Uh, this is another case just to show you that urocele carcinoma with glandular differentiation. Sometimes we can have very extensive glandular differentiation as we see here, uh, but cytokeratin 7 actually it is uh, positive. And this is another case I got it at the same time of this, uh, um, the first case. So uh, this is just to show you the florid cystitis glandulars can be uh, actually going deep into the muscle like that and showing pseudo replication, but there is no cytological atypia at all. And there is no necrosis. Thank you. Any questions? Um, yeah, I think we have a question. Um... Uh, there is a question from uh, Dr. Pathak. Are there any lower GI symptoms in this patient? What was their primary clinical presentation? Well, I guess maybe that was before you said the, the, the imaging. The imaging. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, uh, this one, we got it without any history, uh, as usual. And we uh, started to work with the case. And after that, you know, of course, we got uh, the clinical history that th there is a local uh, rectal, rectal adenocarcinoma. Yeah. Um, yes. Anytime, actually, if we have something like that, even without any history, and uh, there is no history of uh, colonic cancer, and we have this pattern, we have to, um, you know, uh, you know um, uh, also clinical correlation, like uh, suggest the clinical correlation to do a colonoscopy and exclude the, um, colonic cancer because the treatment will be different, right? You will have cystectomy because of uh, uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, like metastatic adenocarcinoma, not primary adenocarcinoma. So um, yeah, we have to uh, give a comment all the time. I mean, same here. I, I have to say, I'm yet to find the beta catenin behaving, like for yeah. these cases. Like I've had it a few times and, and there was a very strong history. So it was helpful. Yeah. Um, but and, and and I'm yet to find the beta catenin behaving as a, a nuclear staining for for these uh, colonic metastatic uh, cases. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah actually, I I want to show this case because sometimes we rely on the stains <clears throat> like 100% should be uh, this pattern. But no, we have to use everything together, like put everything together. So this one uh, actually uh, the beta catenin uh, with primary adenocarcinoma more like in the cytoplasm, yeah. but there is a studies that mention that no, at least 20%, you can have absent uh, nuclear staining for metastatic colonic adenocarcinoma to the better. Yeah, when, when it's nuclear, it's helpful. When it's not, yeah. then it doesn't help. It doesn't still, help. It can be either or still, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, I, well, we structured it that the first half was non-kidney. Those of you who know me would know I'm, I'm a kidney person <laughs> and the second half is the kidney. Um, so, uh, so now we move on to kidney cases. Um, and, and I would like to start with um, Dr. Andrew Evans. So I was very excited today to have two of my mentors, Dr. Carol Tripkov and Dr. Andrew Evans. So, uh, so Dr. Andrew Evans is um, the chief of laboratory medicine and pathology at McKenzie Health. And Dr. Evans, uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. I think you're still muted, Dr. Evans. I think you're still muted. Here we go. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, 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 we can. Okay. So thanks very much for the invitation. 
and I'll do my best not to uh, not to go over time. It's a bit of a complicated story, um, but um, <clears throat> suffice to say, here we go. I'll just maximize it here. Okay, so it was a 24-year-old male. I saw this case three years ago. It came as a consult when I was at UHN. So 24-year-old male with a recent history of stage one testicular cancer had a right orchidectomy showing seminoma. And in follow-up imaging, staging CT scan revealed an enhancing 4.7 centimeter mass in the mid pool of the right kidney. So immediately they thought, okay, could this be a primary renal tumor? Um, a, second, uh, a second tumor, benign or malignant, or could it be um, uh, a metastasis from the seminoma, which in, you know, I've certainly seen uh, such examples described in the literature, but over the course of my career of over 20 years, I've never seen a metastatic germ cell tumor, seminoma, or non-sem to, uh, to the kidney. Um, importantly, they had, um, had uh, track this, this mass on imaging. So uh, on two CT scans that were performed four months apart, there was no interval growth. Renal function was normal, and they decided to, um, uh, to perform a percutaneous biopsy of the renal mass uh, to determine benign, malignant, germ cell tumor, et cetera. And so the referring pathologist differential diagnosis after, after reviewing the slides was, could this be some type of a, of a translocation carcinoma, particularly <clears throat> a TFEB T611? And from some of the features, I can see why they thought that. Other possibilities, thyroid follicular-like carcinoma, which seems to be an entity, I think in my experience, like a unicorn. Maybe Carol has seen one, but I've never seen it. It's just described as an emerging entity. And then some other possibility. So here's a CT scan that shows the image of the mid pole of the right kidney, exophytic. And <clears throat> I will show you if I can, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can share the digital slide. Okay, so you're seeing a digital slide now? Yes, yeah. we are. Okay. I was muted. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I think this is just important. I'll just do a quick, quick flyby on this one. So it shows you all the cores um, have the same, the same features. Um, essentially, what, what strikes you right away is there are a lot of cystic spaces. It's very fibrotic. Uh, there are also, um, we zoom right in, we can see there's some thyroidization of, uh, of renal tubules. And then you've got these dissociated little round cells within the cystic spaces. And without hunting around too much, there is um, there's uh, dystrophic calcification here and here. We're, we're we're not seeing the zoomed in, or I'm not. I'm not sure. Well, it's not zooming in on you. No, just oh, the low power. Okay. Yeah. All right, I will uh, stop sharing there. Let's see, and then go back to the uh, back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so you're back to the PowerPoint now? Not yet. No. Okay, I'll just reshare. Okay, now you should have yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So these are the features that I wanted to show from the digital slide. So there's the stromal fibrosis with cystic spaces and very atrophic looking tubules with some focal thyroidization, which you can see here and here. Here's another example, just a higher magnification of that. Again, the cystic spaces, fibrosis, thyroidization of tubules. And this is the dystrophic calcification that I wanted to show. Um, there were also cystic uh, spaces with apparent glomerular tufts that looked very atrophic or almost like they were involuting uh, with eosinophilic extracellular material and loosely cohesive round cells. And I think these features were probably what got the person uh, who sent me the case thinking about a TFEB carcinoma. I won't go into the, into the features of that, but there is this second cell population in addition to predominantly clear cells where you see these um, round, um, round uh, conglomerates of uh, very small uniform cells with eosinophilic material. And I think that's where that idea arose. And then of course, with the thyroidization, uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea of a thyroid follicular variant renal cell carcinoma. Um, going in higher magnification, the cystic spaces with these apparent glomerular tufts. And then there's this, again, with this extracellular eosinophilic material, and then these loosely cohesive um, round uniform cells. 
And when you throw immunohistochemistry at them, they're positive for WT1. So this strong positivity there within the cystic spaces, and this identified these as, as being podocytes. Now, I mentioned in my title slide, I actually acknowledged um, input from uh, my, one of my um, nephropathology medical kidney colleagues at UHN, Dr. Rohan John, who was really instrumental in helping me work this up. Because when I looked at this, this case, um, just to reference, um, perhaps I'm dating myself, but if you think back to the movie Kindergarten Cop with, uh, with um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I'd, he complained to the uh, kids that he was looking after that he had a bad headache, and one of the kids said, oh, you've probably got a brain tumor. And then he said, it's not a tumor. So that's what I started thinking to myself, is that this was not a neoplasm after all, that it perhaps was something else. So... We go back, this is the referring pathologist differential, and this is what we called it. So we settled in on an atrophic kidney-like lesion. Uh, this is a series here, um, and I did actually run this past Jesse McKinney at the time. Um, and important to note that atrophic kidney-like lesion, it's a very rare finding, and typically present, uh, patients are less than 30 years. This is the only one of these I've ever seen. Um, the published series to date, as far as I'm aware, uh, have been based on, uh, on surgical resection specimens, not needle core biopsy. So that really increased the, uh, uh, the interest level on this case substantially because we were working with very limited material in the setting of a, of a core biopsy. So if you go back to that MJ Search Path paper um, and you look for the key features, the first one is a thick circumferential capsule, recognizing this is based on, on excised tumors. So a thick circumferential capsule that's rich in smooth muscle, which wasn't evident in our case because the, the needle core went directly into the center of the lesion and didn't sample anything that looked like a capsule. Uh, but what we did have, the follicular cysts with the eosinophilic secretions, the admixed small atrophic tubules, calcifications, cysts containing uh, atrophic glomerular tufts. One thing that we didn't have, which is a key description in the uh, a key descriptor in the uh, or feature in the uh, American Journal of Surgical Pathology paper on the ex surgically excised specimens, was that the parenchyma outside of the mass was was essentially normal. So what we did was just because of the unusual nature of this case and the fact that the patient really didn't want additional surgery if they didn't have to have it, we got the um, uh, the uh, uh, medical imaging, uh, our medical imaging colleagues to go back and do a biopsy of, of adjacent renal parenchyma away from the mass. And lo and behold, it was perfectly normal. So we did put this together as, uh, as an atrophic kidney-like lesion. The, the features were most consistent uh, with that, recognizing again, this is being established on a core biopsy. Um, and then they took that in, in context of, um, of uh, serial imaging, um, which showed no interval growth. And to this point in time, three years later, to the best of my knowledge, the last time I heard um, when I was talking to, um, to the uh, uh, radiologist who was in, most involved with the case at UHN, still uh, uh, up, upwards up to a year later, a year ago rather, uh, there was no interval growth in the, in the mass. So it really was behaving in a benign fashion. Um, so it, in terms of just wrapping this one up, the atrophic kidney-like lesion appears to be, and this is where Rohan came in as a, as a big help, um, he just described this as glomerulocystic change. And so it's glomerulocystic change that had happened to form a mass. And glomerulocystic change is a rare um, focal incidental finding, usually just a microscopic finding, possibly of developmental ischemic or local obstruction etiology. Uh, but the WT1 positivity, which Rohan had recommended, and it's also described in the MJ Search Path paper, uh, provides support for the presence of podocytes or parietal epithelial cells within those spaces. So it established that they were including glomeruli. Um, it's currently unknown whether it represents a neoplastic process, uh, but it, the bottom line is it, it is, appears to be considered benign and based on the biopsy findings and available literature, a decision was made um, in conjunction with the patient, of course, uh, just to continue following with serial imaging uh, to avoid potentially unnecessary and morbid surgery that the patient didn't want. And as I mentioned, um, at last follow-up, um, uh, uh, up to a year ago, uh, the mass was stable and hadn't grown. 
Okay, so that's it. I'm happy to answer any additional questions. I'm curious to see whether, Carol, have you encountered any such lesions on core biopsy? Uh, that's a fascinating case, uh, Andy, and I completely agree with, uh, with your diagnosis. Uh, the current thinking of this on this uh, lesion, and, and I fully agree that this is a lesion, it's uh, that it is some sort of reactive change that forms a tumor-like lesion. This is the only case that I'm aware that has been diagnosed in a great way on a needle core biopsy. Um, some of these uh, over the years, many probably 10, 15 years ago, have been included uh, in the original paper that established the existence of thyroid-like follicular renal cell carcinoma. So they do not belong there. So they were labeled with that name. Um, I think this is a completely benign lesion. All the features that you've described perfectly fit this entity. Just a point, whenever you're thinking about thyroid-like follicular carcinoma, I've seen several of these that I thought this is it. This is the real McCoy over my, uh, in the course of my practice. Make sure that uh, you don't miss a metastasis from thyroid cancer. And I've seen three or four cases with thyroglobulin as well as um, TTF1 being positive, indicating that this is a metastatic lesion, not thyroid-like follicular carcinoma. So this is an entity still struggling to establish itself, still in the realm of emerging provisional entities. There was a recent paper in molecular pathology claiming that a subset of these demonstrates one specific molecular um, uh, change, but we, we are missing that molecular link as well as a, a, a very standard morphology, immunohistochemistry to make it into a compelling story. I'm talking about thyroid-like follicular carcinoma, but this is completely different thing. It's a reactive stuff. Uh, it's a reactive lesion. I completely agree that this is the patient doesn't need uh, any additional surgery needs to be just follow up, and everything you showed perfectly fits that uh, entity. Yeah. Thanks for the comments, Carol. Thank you. Um, there is one question in the chat from Dr. Moshkin. It's Have you done a Congo red stain on it? Uh, no, we didn't. We didn't, we didn't feel there was the, the background, didn't have the feature of amyloid, didn't have the texture of amyloid, but it, you know, that certainly wouldn't be wrong to do it. It's a fascinating case. Thanks. Um, I would go to next presenter, uh, Dr. Christopher Davidson from Kingston, Ontario. Dr. Davidson, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, the entity I'm going to present is a lot more common than what's been presented so far, but it was interesting because I've had a couple of these cases come through on needle biopsy, and that, that'll be the case here, as we'll see. So the case is that of a 55-year-old male with an incidentally discovered renal mass, <clears throat> no significant past medical history, no prior history of malignancy. CT with contrast showed in the left kidney an exophytic 1.6 centimeter renal mass with heterogeneous enhancement. There were some simple cysts in the other side and a 1.2 centimeter mass in the right adrenal that was felt to be most consistent with adenoma. This is a photomicrograph, <clears throat> relatively uh, low power, showing the lesion. Um, going up to higher power, you can see that there's the suggestion of a tubular, at least focal tubular architecture, and also the suggestion of uh, maybe um, emerging papillary uh, structures as well, even down here. Moving to even uh, higher power, one can appreciate that at least some of the neoplastic cells that comprise this lesion um, have this uh, linear array or this lining up of the nuclei away from the basal aspect of the, uh, the basement membrane, and that there is often uh, this clearing uh, underneath the nuclei. Moving on to immunistic chemistry, this tumor was diffusely positive for CK7. Uh, and negative for AMACR, of course, thinking the papillary and tubular structures one could consider papillary renal cell carcinoma. This was negative for AMACR, which you'd expect to be positive in a papillary renal cell, particularly type one. CD10 was also negative. Um, with the clearing of the cells, one could consider uh, a clear cell renal cell carcinoma or papillary, both of which stain uh, CD10 with a membranous fashion, of course, with apical accentuation in a papillary renal cell carcinoma and circumferential membranous in a uh, clear cell. Uh, CA9 did stain these cells. And interestingly, if you look at high power, 
it's seeing these cells in, in a cup-like fashion. So you can see that the, the basement membrane, um, the membrane adjacent to the basement membrane, if you will, the basal basement, uh, basal membrane stains, as do the uh, lateral membranes. But the apical aspect of the membrane, it doesn't stain, forming a cup-like staining pattern. So this is quite characteristic of what we ended up calling this lesion, which was a clear cell papillary renal cell carcinoma. Um, the WHO, this exists, this is a defined lesion, of course, in the WHO. Um, it's defined as an indolent renal epithelial neoplasm comprised of bland, clear epithelial cells arranged in tubules and papillae with at least uh, focally a predominantly line nuclear alignment away from the basement membrane and a distinctive immunophenotype. So far, it's believed that if this tumor is excised, it's uh, cured. Um, but uh, information, you know, we're collect continuing to collect information about the clinical behavior of these lesions. Um, initially, it was described in association with end-stage renal disease, though it also, as in this case, occurs sporadically. Uh, typically, they're discovered incidentally, and apparently, they're the fourth most common type of renal cell carcinomas, comprising one to four percent of all renal cells in adults. The morphology, characteristically, they're low-grade uh, nuclei. The cells have low-grade nuclei. Um, we assigned ours as uh, uh, I sub grade uh, two. Um, if you have a higher grade lesion, you should consider other uh, things on your differential. They have a tubular papillary architecture, and they have that arrangement of the nuclei away from the basement membrane in a, in a sort of a linear array, if you will, that form these glands and um, papillae. Some of these tumors have a predominant smooth muscle uh, associated with predominant smooth muscle stroma, and uh, these had previously been described as renal angiomyoadenomatous tumor. Uh, genetics, suffice to say, they're genetically uh, different from a clear cell renal cell carcinoma or papillary renal cell carcinoma. Um, Next-gen sequencing has identified mutations in MET, P10, ERB4, uh, and STK11. And they have a, a unique uh, microRNA um, expression profile. Immunistochemically, uh, they stain as um, renal cell carcinomas do with PAX2 and PAX8. They're also positive for CK7 and 34 beta E12, a high molecular weight keratin. Interestingly, we don't have in our center 34 beta E12. We've replaced it with CK5 and have not had the same kind of staining. Um, with that marker for high molecular weight keratin for these tumors. And CA9, as we've discussed, has this cup-like staining pattern. They're negative typically for CD10, AMACR, and TFE3. Uh, I just wanted to visit, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but it's uh, an interesting sort of suggested initial panel at very least to entertain what other possible entities may have these morphologic features and an immuno panel, which might help resolve that. So this is a 20, from a 19, 2019 paper showing that in the differential between clear cell papillary, clear cell papillary and these XP11 translocation renal cell carcinomas, that a profile uh, immuno um, uh, panel of CK7, CA9, CD10, AMACR and TFE3 can be quite helpful. Now, in my hands, um, when considering a renal cell, uh, sorry, translocation renal cell carcinoma, I'm reassured when I see very strong set of keratin staining because typically translocation carcinomas underexpress epithelial markers. Um, and that's essentially my presentation. I'd happily uh, take any questions. Um, so uh, do you have, oh, Dr. Evans, uh, Dr. Evans, go ahead. You have your hands up. Hey, yep. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Chris. That, um, just a quick, a quick word. In, in my experience with uh, urologists who aren't familiar with this entity, I've seen them launch into great uh, presentations at tumor boards over patients having papillary renal cell carcinoma or clear cell renal cell carcinoma when uh, a, a core biopsy was signed out as, uh, as clear cell papillary. And so there can be a bit of a nomenclature problem. And so I've had to explain, you know, we had to, to explain to them at great length and every time one of these cases came up, show it at, uh, at the tumor board round so that they understood it was actually not a clear cell, not a papillary, but a clear cell papillary. And um, I'm sure Carol will have some comments on this as well, but uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Michelle Hirsch at, uh, in Boston, um, had advocated for inserting the term tubulo in there, so clear cell tubulo papillary. So that would, if the urologist or the clinician is reading the report fully, 
they'll realize that it's a different entity. So that's that's been my experience with these these lesions. I know Carol, do you wanna? Yeah, I completely agree with you, Andy. I, I call it TSL tubular papillary, primarily because the the bulk of the architecture is tubular. And if you see papilla, they're usually very small, blunt, wimpy papilla. You will sometimes even struggle to find papilla. So I think clear cell tubular papillary. Nevertheless, WHO settled on that. We can follow WHO or not. Uh, a comment, uh, sometimes you may see this kind of areas within a clear cell carcinoma. So you see an obvious clear cell carcinoma and focal area that looks like clear cell tubular pathway. This has been a very well-described phenomenon. There were papers published, don't fall into the trap saying this is clear cell tubular papillary arising in a clear cell carcinoma. These are just clear cell carcinomas. They behave as clear cell carcinomas. They have this clear cell tubular papillary alike areas, uh, they shouldn't be graded because clear cell is and papillary should be graded. And if you're applying grade, just say equivalent to grade whatever, because they're essentially a benign neoplasm. Uh, I don't know exactly because I wasn't part of that uh, working group. The new WHO probably will change the nomenclature on this entity because there is probably one questionable case over the years that has been documented with uh, with metastasis out of probably several hundred described in the literature. And some people strongly advocate that they should be labeled as uh, a neoplasm of low malignant potential instead of calling them frankly benign. Like this is an entity that's likely behind benign if it's the right uh, diagnosis. So to my knowledge, there is the, just that one uh, case that has been described, I think, out of uh, Mayo Clinic with a metastasis in the liver, but the primary was not resected. So even that case can be questioned. So essentially, this is an entity probably in transition towards something benign or low malignant potential. We'll see how the, uh, the new WHO uh, classification will handle it. I actually have, have the same experience with urologists is that um, they either call it either clear cell or papillary. And now when I diagnose it, I, I enter a comment saying these are indolent so-and-so and I, 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 and I quote an article or something mentioning that they are in, in, indolent or possibly of low malignant potential. Same thing. Um, I'll next present a case and I had wanted to present my case after the clear cell papillary seeing Dr. Davidson uh, presentation because I feel there's a bit of a theme. Um, so let me share. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hope everyone should see my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, of course I'll talk about something papillary. <laughs> uh, it's a very specific entity really that I want to talk about today. Um, so the clinical presentation was a 51 years old male uh, with history of end stage renal disease due to hypertension, and he was status post renal transplant. And his native kidneys were were like uh, they remained; they hadn't removed them, and they were following them up with imaging. And during the follow up, um, he was found to have in the right kidney an enhancing lower pole uh, exophytic lesion measuring 2.1 centimeters that was suspicious for a renal cell carcinoma. Well, given that the, the kidney was atrophic and the patient wasn't really dependent on it, um, having a transplant, so they, they removed the native kidney. Uh, so it came to us with a radical, uh, right radical nephrectomy and grossly it was a cystic kidney, um, termed the, the, the PAs called it innumerable number of cysts and there was this mass, it was well circumscribed, slightly friable, subcapsular, bulging the capsule, but not infiltrating into the fat and measuring 1.8 centimeters. Um, and you can see on low power, it's quite a, a well circumscribed mass and looks like it's a papillary something maybe. Um, and on, on higher power, um, it's, an, isn't if it's an oncocytic lesion, papillary lesion. Um, and similar to the previous case with the clear cell papillary, the, the nuclei are aligned very linearly uh, opposite to the basement membrane. Um, some areas had this sort of punched out lumina. I've noted this phenomena. It has not really been reported on, but I've noticed it in a, in a previous case before. But it's very striking with the linear arrangement of cells, not really crowded or pseudostratified in any way. 
um, linear and opposite to the basement membrane, very oncocytic. And, and the, the very important feature is it's a low grade lesion. You would call this an ISOP one to two at most. It's a vesicular nuclei, but it's not a grade three. Um, so a low grade oncocytic papillary lesion with a very specific morphology and it's really a very specific entity that I, that I wanna talk about. It's been in the literature in the past two years or three years. So differential diagnosis, is, is it a papillary RCC? Uh, is it a high grade or a low grade? Because the differential varies if it's a low grade versus a high grade. So it's a low grade lesion. So usually differentials for low grade are something like a clear cell papillary or a metanephric adenomoji. This doesn't fit, it's very oncocytic. Is it a high grade papillary? So usually high grade papillaries are the ones that get this isinophilic look like the old type two that's, that's now not favored anymore. Um, but it, it's not bad though. It, so differentials for something that's high grade, something like the FH deficient RCC or a translocation RCC. Is it a, that's an old type two or a high grade papillary RCC? Or is it its own thing? Is it an oncocytic papillary RCC? Um, so staining, um, racemase is usually positive. It's always almost positive in papillary RCC. So this one I called negative. I mean, if we look close, it can be called weak or very weak patchy racemase, but not typical of a papillary RCC. Um, CK7 is positive. Well, again, this is sort of a discrepancy. Like usually the, the isinophilic papillary RCCs or the high grade isinophilic ones are, are weak or, or even negative for, for CK7. And the very key stain here is GABA3. So, um, and this is what makes this entity specific. So GABA3 is positive, diffusely positive for this entity. So this entity has evolved. Um, I have actually reported on this entity in, in, in 2017. Before that, there were um, reports in the literature of an oncocytic low-grade papillary RCC. But if you look at these old articles, you find that they're not really all describing the same thing. You look, they were not, it wasn't really a uniform entity other than th there was this feeling that some of these oncocytic low-grade papillary RCCs are, are just really indolent entities, but there was no uniformity in terms of morphology or staining or how to pick them up. Um, in, in 2017, we had an article that describes a, a papillary RCC spectrum of, of categories. And, and one of them was what we called at the time was type four. And it had this very specific morphology. And in our cohort of 108 cases, we had six cases. They had this oncocytic morphology, linear cell arrangement, similar to a clear cell papillary, but oncocytic, low grade, GABA3 positive. And they were significantly smaller than the papillary RCC cohort. So actually most of our cases were in the range of a papillary adenoma. Our largest case at the time was at three centimeters. And they all had no disease progression. But since then, I think this is the terminology that people know it by now, the papillary renal neoplasma of reverse polarity. So Dr. Ubedi has reported on this on, on, on multiple articles, um, ha has described a bigger cohort, and has additionally described that, okay, th they sometimes have hyalinized papillary cores. They don't have any features of aggressive uh, disease, so no necrosis, no mitosis. Um, it doesn't have calcifications usually. IHC's GABA3 was positive. CK7 is positive, typical. Lycan positive. I don't have much experience with Lycan, so I kind of tend to ignore this. But then the, the, uh, another interesting feature is the weak negative RAS maze and, and negative Vimentin, which is not usual for, for papillary RCCs. Um, and and uh, a very specific mutation that's found in 80 to 90% of these cases is the KRAS mutations, always, almost, almost always in XN2 or codon 12. Case KRAS mutations in about 80 to 90% of, of, of these cases. Um, so there are more than 73 cases published in the literature about this entity and, and no evidence of disease progression, very decent uh, follow-up available and, and really no disease progression at all. Uh, almost all cases are PT1A. In fact, there's one case that's PT1B was reported on, was a 4.5 centimeters. Um, and that case wasn't typical either by morphology or immuno. So actually most cases are under the four centimeters cut, cut off of a PT1A. Uh, the importance really is to not mistake this for a high grade papillary RCC, like a type two like, an old type two like, or a high grade papillary RCC. And also to not mistake any oncocytic papillary RCC for this entity. So we're implying this is um, an indolent, perhaps benign entity, versus not all oncocytic papillary RCCs or isinophilic papillary RCCs are, are benign or indolent. 
So it's just, it's just important to, to meet all like morphological criteria and all um, and the immunohistochemistry as well. Um, okay, I'll stop sharing. Um, okay, um, I have no questions. I don't know if Dr. Evans, Dr. Triptiv, do you have any comments on? Great presentation, spot on the money. This is an easy diagnosis when once people are aware, they can very easily make this diagnosis. It's a good news for the patient, as you've as you've said. And I believe we just had a paper joint with Albaidi and you showing that even very small lesions such as this one demonstrate this KRAS mutation. So it seems that even on a molecular level, they demonstrate something different. Yeah. Um. And someone was uh, messaging that they can't hear. I can hear everybody. I mean, I can hear the presenters and <laughs> you, Rola, for sure. Okay, good. Good. That and do you have any comments? Oh, yeah. no, no. Excellent presentation, Rola. Um, just a quick question, just for, for everyone in the group. Um, you'd mentioned the idea about uh, many of these lesions being adenoma size. So if it was less than less than 15 millimeters, what you know, would somebody be faulted for just signing this thing out as a as a papillary renal adenoma and describing it, or what would what would be your recommended approach there? I was going to ask that question, and I forgot, so I'm happy you asked it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. So Dr. Tripp and Dr. Evans, what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> it's a benign entity. It doesn't matter what you call it. Yeah. It's a neoplasm. It doesn't progress. It doesn't metastasize. So I think uh, the, the size would not be uh, of any importance. It has been shown actually that uh, even the larger lesions and those that are very small behave in the same fashion. Yep, yeah, that would be my approach as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think we, we move on to the last presentation, Dr. Tripkov. You're, uh, yeah. Thank so you, Rola. So here is the last presentation and I hope that uh, I will make things uh, clearer or more muddied depends on what you what your angle or perception on on some renal tumors kidney is very difficult you know uh, everybody should recognize that uh, even if you play the odds if you don't know what it is close your eyes and say clear cell renal cell carcinoma 70 percent of them will be that about 15 percent will be pillory five six to seven percent will be both oncocytoma and chromophobe and the rest of us in the rest of the, the, the about five to 10% are a minefield. And we have been trying to walk through this minefield for the benefit of the patient. And my approach has always been to go with morphology, to go with morphology and limited immunoprofile. I don't believe that molecular should be the prerequisite to make the right diagnosis. The problem is some of these new entities or newer entities that we think our entities were orphans, orphans for, for, for a long time. And we're trying to, to form at least a uh, few biological families that make sense from the morphologic, immunohistochemical, uh, uh, molecular, and, and clinical fashion. So with that intro, I just want to sort of touch upon a topic of, of difficult to classify oncocytic renal tumors. You can see this was a five centimeter mass with a slightly different appearing central part. Here is a low power magnification, a a uh, tumor that was really pink. If I show you higher magnification of the photo on the left, you'll say oncocytoma, what's your problem? Uh, the problem is that it's not an oncocytoma, it's a pink neoplasm and it breaks down into cords and tubules. And there is a little bit of stroma that paler area also shows a little bit of a different cellular composition with these amphophilic looking cells with slightly bland nuclei around two oval with some clefting. And we have thrown a lot of immunos on this particular uh, neoplasm, and you can see the positive stains, and clearly a renal neoplasm, uh, seven patches, CD10 focal, vimentin, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, FHSDHB are retained. Here are the negative stains. Importantly, CA9 rules out in great majority of cases some clear cell carcinoma. CD117 was negative, catepsin K, HMP45, melanate. Those are the markers that I typically use for translocation type carcinoma. Catepsin K is the best marker for 
angiomyolipoma, if you need to use one, just use catepsin K. We have done also very uh, BER EP4, MOC31. Some of these have been described, the oncocytoma and chromophobe, but they were negative. So the differential diagnosis with such a tumor is usually broad, and the, 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 the usual suspects are oncocytoma, chromophobe, renal cell carcinoma, or something in between in the setting of hereditary uh, syndrome such as Berthoff Dubé, they usually tend to demonstrate features in between oncocytoma and chromophobe, some features of oncocytoma, some features of chromophobe, but inherently difficult to classify. Nevertheless, if you go down the list, you will see that even clear cell carcinoma, papillary or uh, oncocytic renal cell carcinoma, even uh, some translocation type cancers, TFEB can be very oncocytic, for instance, as well as SDH deficient, FH deficient, particularly low grade and epithelioid angiomyolipoma. But this is none of those. So this case, in my view, does not fit any of the recognized renal tumors or categories. And essentially, we have two questions to answer. The first question, how should we sign this case? And the second question is maybe and here is the new part that I'd like to share with you to increase your sort of awareness of some new and emerging entities that you should consider in this definition. But it's completely legit if you want to sign this case as unclassified using a filiconcocytic pink renal tumor, uh, small size, relatively low grade, low nuclear features. You can say absence of necrosis, ATP, et cetera, et cetera, favor low grade, follow up is warranted. Uh, many GU uh, pathologists actually grapple with this issue of these pink tumors that they cannot quite fit into a well-defined uh, category, particularly for these tumors with mixed or inconclusive features between oncocytoma and chromophobe. They feel that they should be in some sort of intermediate diagnostic category and they're not labeled unequivocally as benign or malignant, they're typically labeled as oncocytic neoplasms or tumors, and usually people include a comment. The comment is uh, oncocytic renal neoplasm and then modifier terms, low grade, borderline features, unclassified, low malignant potential, uncertain malignant potential, hybrid tumor, hybrid features. And I would like to point to these two publications, particularly on uh, these new developments in existing WHO entities that came in 2021, which tries to address this issue. So uh, gene to urinary pathologists aside, the consensus, and we have basically discussed this very long, in a, in a very sort of long, and we, we struggled with how to, to deal with these type of uh, tumors. And along the line of, you know, some people are, are splitters, some people are lumpers, but definitely there is a group of borderline or uh, tumors that can be uh, clearly classified with this mixed inconclusive features between onco and chromophobe. And we propose the term to be used uniformly oncocytic renal neoplasm of low malignant potential, not further classified. And this term should denote uh, a tumor uh, that should be solitary, not multiple, not bilateral. These are sporadic tumors, and this is not an entity. This is a description of a category that it's a clinical management category of possibly some heterogeneous renal neoplasms that uh, have low risk of metastatic disease. Hybrid uh, is a term in the literature has been used for a long time, but I would say has been labeled uh, all sorts of tumors have been labeled hybrid. We propose that hybrid should be restricted only to these hereditary cases where you have multiple and bilateral tumors, for example, as in BHD or oncocytosis. So oncocytic renal neoplasm, low malignant potential, if it doesn't really fit into oncocytoma and chromophobe and hybrid, oncocytic tumor, if it's, a, it's in a setting, bilateral, multifocal in the setting uh, of hereditary disease. However, there two tumors that I'd like to uh, share with you. These are emerging entities. And in my view, they potentially represent new entities that you should be aware of. And I will try to make my case briefly about both of these entities. So here is a tumor, and this is all originating from one oncocytic tumor. On the left, it looks more like oncocytoma, no problem, round two oval nuclei. Maybe you, even here you can see perinuclear clearing, on the right-hand side, maybe more oncocytic chromophobe renal cell carcinoma because more prominent uh, perinuclear clearings, but the nuclei are invariably round to oval there. They don't show any nuclear irregularities. Nevertheless, CD117 is completely negative and we expect both of these to be positive and cytokeratin 7 is diffusely positive. 
you wouldn't expect diffuse positivity in an oncocytoma. It's more of a patchy, scattered, isolated cell uh, pattern that you see in oncocytoma for cytokeratin cell. And this would be more like uh, uh, chromophobe. But we postulated a couple of years ago that there is a distinct group of tumors that are very easy to recognize uh, on morphology with this very consistent immunohistochemical pattern. And we labeled them low-grade oncocytic tumors with this phenotype of CD117 uh, negative. A couple of cases were very weak and, and, and uh, uh, focal CD117 positive. This was a series of about 28 cases from four different institutions. They look mahogany brown or brown. Great majority of them are very small, three to four centimeters, but some larger examples have been documented. They were all single tumors. Uh, they were slightly more common in females, and they were invariably because a, a small size, low stage, PT1, PT1B, PT1A, or B90%. On follow-up, all cases that we had follow-up on, with decent follow-up were alive without evidence of disease progression, and they didn't demonstrate any significant chromosomal abnormalities, gains, or losses, except these 19P, 19Q, 1P, and some had disomic status. This uh, publication, however, had very limited molecular analysis on, the, analysis on a subset of these cases. As I've mentioned, no other chromosomal gains or losses were seen, which means they did not show the typical a genetic profile of chromosome renal cell carcinoma. And here are a few examples. They are on morphology at low power magnification, they're non-encapsulated, well circumscribed pink tumors. At the periphery, they're usually more solid in the central parts. They demonstrate this more, they may demonstrate this more trabecular arrangement. Some areas demonstrate almost typical oncocytoma-like uh, features, and this is Pro, uh, very uh, prominent in, in, in some cases. However, uh, some other cases also may look like uh, oncocytoma with, with more compact uh, nested pattern. Some other areas uh, or some tumors may show a little bit more perinuclear clearing, a little bit more prominent uh, cytoplasmic membranes, but no nuclear irregularities or no significant nuclear irregularities, which is one of the commonly uh, expected feature in chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. Here is that trabecular pattern. And the feature that is very helpful when recognizing this type of uh, tumor is this uh, sharp transition into loose stromal areas where you see these scattered individual cells. And I've uh, labeled this uh, morphology as boats in a bay. So you see scattered boats that are parked in this bay. And uh, at high magnification, some are slightly elongated, some are more epithelioid. Some areas may look even like tissue culture, but there is a sharp transition into these areas. And these are different from those areas that you see and label as archipelagenous growth. Here is an archipelago with your islands and peninsulas of more substantive cellular aggregates. And here is a uh, boat in a bay picture that you see in low-grade oncocytic tumor. Okay, this is a, a morphologic feature. So you may argue it's subtle, but it's very helpful in these cases. And invariably, you're faced with this uh, immunophenotype that I have noticed many years ago, but I've ignored it completely because I thought CD117 has not worked in these tumors till I saw several cases in a sequence that made me think that this may be there may be something in this immunoprofile. So the CD117 negativity with diffuse positivity. And here is the most typical sort of profile with CK7 positive CD11 negative, bionentin is negative as in majority of oncocytoma and chromophobes, and GATA3 is uniformly positive. GATA3 is a very promiscuous marker, as you well know, stains many things. In this instance, it may be helpful uh, now, people may ask, so how does oncocytoma stain for GATA? In my experience, it's uniformly negative. There is one report where half of chromophobes do stain. I have not done a formal study in my experience. I've seen it in few cases, but in a very patchy fashion, never in a diffuse fashion. So that remains still to be uh, elucidated. But in my experience, they are all uh, uniformly positive and uh, 
I think this is a helpful feature on immunohistochemistry. On electron microscopy, they have abundant intracytoplasmic mitochondria, as you would expect to see in oncocytoma. And some of these cases have been previously labeled as eosinophilic chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. Here are a few examples from the TCGA cohort of uh, 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 chromophobe renal cell carcinoma labeled eosinophilic, and they demonstrate a diploid chromosomal pattern. Some of these have been shown in that uh, study to have TSC mutations but they were labeled as eosinophilic chromophobe. They lacked multiple chromosomal losses. So I'm postulating that, you know, we have uh, talked and thought about duality between oncocytoma and chromophobe, whereas there is this overlap that people struggled with. And I've seen over my 20 years, you know, trying, uh, people try to find the magic marker to differentiate between the two. The point is in this uh, overlapping parking lot, between oncocytoma and chromophobe, there are probably some distinct pink renal tumors that reside in, in, in this morphologic sort of uh, milieu of, of uh, uh, morphologic overlap. And here is more recent data within the last few months. There are two papers that have been published on lot from two uh, groups, one from Dallas, from the States, one from a uh, French group from Paris they found frequent TSCM tor mutations, not multiple chromosomal losses, but very frequent TSCM tor mutations. We initially, we found that they're only isolated. They've also found that some of these have occurred in TSC patients, rare examples with multiple uh, such tumors, some with other tumors that you see in TSC patients, but very frequent TSCM tor mutations in both studies. And also there is this marker POXY1, which I have no, uh, experience with, but at least based on the literature, it says that it's positive in the intercalated cells of the kidney and both oncocytoma and chromophobe are positive, yet lot is uniformly negative, at least in this study. And there is one other study where a couple of cases from Michigan were shown to be negative for POXY1. So it seems that they're different morphologically, uh, they're different on the level of immunohistochemistry and genetically. So in summary, I've shown you uh, and proposed to you that you should be alert to recognize this low-grade oncocytic tumor, which is not a very difficult tumor to recognize because it demonstrates this very consistent morphology and immunoprofile, generally a sporadic uh, type of tumor, but rare cases can be seen in TSC patient and this does not completely fit either oncocytoma or chromophobe and you're in between when you're not going to label it. I don't know what this is, oncocytic tumor, not uh, further specified. Uh, and in some recent studies from Mayo Clinic and from other places in Indiana, many of these cases have been labeled and I've labeled them in my uh, past life as eosinophilic chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. And probably we need to come up with better diagnostic criteria for eosinophilic renal cell uh, chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, and some have been even labeled oncocytoma. They're uniformly indolent. This is very important. And currently, there are more than 150 of these cases described with over 100, 110 patients documented. And we have published on this just recently in 2019. And I think that there are more than 50 citations already, which means that we have not invented this entity. <laughs> it exists because if practice cannot confirm something that you put forth, then probably it's not real. And we've mentioned that these uh, other findings are a loss of 19p, frequent loss of 1p, but no other chromosomal losses and frequent TSCM mutations. So this is one entity that I'd like you to consider in your sort of future practice when you're trying to say, I don't know what this pink tumor is, could this be a lot? That's one question. And very briefly, I just want to alert you to another unusual eosinophilic pink uh, renal tumor, uh, which is also very easy to recognize if you are aware of its features. At uh, mid to high power magnification, you're struck with this vacuolization, uh, very marked vacuolization of the cytoplasm and very uh, high grade nuclear morphology with very prominent nucleoli, sometimes even looking like uh, viral inclusions. So this is uh, a tumor that when you first look at it, you would consider, could this be chromophobe? Could this be oncocytoma? Probably too much for an oncocytoma. Oncocytoma doesn't really look like this. And I will tell you what my initial thinking was when I encounter such cases, but that's the differential that you're usually uh, enter, uh, ent entertaining. 
Initially, when we uh, published on this uh, paper a few years ago, we labeled it high-grade oncocytic renal tumor. I mean, we were trying to come up with some, some descriptive term, uh, and we described 14 cases from several institutions. We, this is currently still an emerging renal entity, but I strongly believe that this is a real entity. And uh, you, know, you may see it in your practice, you may label it something else, but you should consider it. And, and I will provide some evidence uh, collected so far why I think this is a distinct renal entity. Uh, they're typically mahogany brown or tan on gross and uh, on immunohistochemistry, they're invariably positive for catepsin K. Now we have mentioned catepsin K in translocation type cancers, in angiomyelite, pulma. Also catepsin K is uniformly uh, expressed in some of these newer entities that demonstrate uh, uh, mutations of the TSCM tor pathway as well as CD117 being positive, uniformly positive in great majority of cases and CD10 invariably being positive and I've listed the other positive stains. Now, cytokeratin 7 stains only rare positive cells. So if you take together the CD117 positivity and rare cells positive, it has oncocytoma-like uh, immunoprofile uh, but catepsin K clearly does not fit into this picture. And initially, you know, when I was thinking about this kind of tumors, one of the names that I toyed with was oncocytoma on steroids because it looks like too much for an oncocytoma, high grade. But you know, the, the, the name has evolved from that initial terminology that we used and some other terminologies were used in the literature. Clearly, these cases have no TFE3 or TFEB rearrangement and they're all indolent. Rare cases have also been documented in patients with uh, uh, tuberous sclerosis. Here is an angiomyolipoma that's very nicely positive, and this tumor is very nicely and strongly positive for catepsin K. And you can appreciate this very conspicuous morphology with vacuolation, large vacuoles in the cytoplasm and this high-grade uh, nuclear appearance. Uh, on electron microscopy, they're invariably filled with mitochondria, and some of these cysts likely represent dilated uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum cysts. Uh, so what you see on, on, on light microscopy, you can see on electron microscopy. Here is a very recent study that uh, uh, we published uh, on cases collected from multiple institutions where we could prove that all cases that we were able to analyze, 19 cases, demonstrated uniform TSCM tor mutations, not multiple chromosomal losses, nothing else, just TSCM tor mutation. So our conclusion was that uh, this EVT is an emerging or eosinophilic vacuolated tumor, which is the term that uh, we would like to promote, which captures the, the uh, morphologic uh, uh, criteria to, to recognize this entity, eosinophilic and vacuolated tumor, tumor because it's benign, uh, is a tumor that uh, uh, shows frequent non-overlapping mutations. Here is an example of a case that I saw uh, on Twitter, and I was able to make a diagnosis on the basis of few HNEs, because HNE is very characteristic for this tumor, and I suggested the immunoprofile uh, before the, 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 the pathologist did it. So once you're aware, this is not a difficult diagnosis. That's what I'm trying to say. So in summary, this is a solid EVT or eosinophilic vacuolated tumor. It's a solid, relatively small tumor, uh, demonstrating indolent behavior. Great majority are sporadic, but the rare cases are seen in TSC patients. In morphology is for this one, as well as for eosinophilic vacuolated tumor, essentially it's an h &E diagnosis. I wouldn't promote it if you need molecular. I don't do molecular on great majority of these because I can't and it's not feasible, but based on morphology and immunohistochemistry, you can recognize these tumors based on the features of eosinophilic cells with large vacuoles and high-grade nuclear appearance. Catepsin K is invariably positive as well as CKIT and a diffusely positive and cytokeratin 7 in only rare cells in an oncocytoma-like profile. Uh, uniform mutations characterize this entity or frequent mutations, I should say, in TSC and mTOR genes. And with that, I've mentioned several times this. GUPS is Genitourinary Pathology Society, and I would uh, invite all people with interest in genitourinary pathology uh, to, to join uh, the society. And I truly hope you don't feel like this, but if you do, I'm here to still answer some of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. That was a great presentation.
Um, I, I, there is one question. Um, so Dr. Belour saying, uh, thanks for a great presentation. And I think she was talking about the, the lots entity. She's saying, how would you sign out these cases on core biopsies? Um, I would be very careful on, on core biopsies. And in general, you should be very careful on, on, on uh, needle core biopsies. And there is a whole sort of um, group of genitourinary pathologists. And I would say probably majority of them practicing in the States that any of these tumors, even when the features are, are absolutely classic by the chromophobe or something is not really fitting for chromophobe or oncocytoma, they would not make this diagnosis on middle core biopsy. They will call it oncocytic tumor. See note, the note will say oncocytic tumor, most likely oncocytoma, provided everything else that I haven't seen represents oncocytoma. My point has been if I can, see the right morphology, the right architecture, the right immunohistochemistry, um, limited immunohistochemistry. I also do Muller-Maury uh, colloidal iron. If it's pink or mostly pink with luminal blush, I would say favor oncocytoma or oncocytoma, and there is no point in, in, in you know, hedging the bets. So some of these uh, lots I, I've diagnosed on needle core biopsy. I can, but if you're not sure, you have the option of oncocytic renal tumor, not further specified. Differential diagnosis includes this and that, and you can include that in a note, as well as hybrids for multifocal and, and bilateral. Particularly, for instance, some of the uh, cases that you may see in the spectrum of BHD, sometimes you have somatic mutations, single tumors. They do demonstrate follicular mutation. These are unknown previously to be part of a hereditary complex. And that's why they, we have even considered that they may look like EVT on morphology, uh, but we have clearly shown that they're FLCN. For some of those, I think it's very difficult to, to, to make that diagnosis. And that's why, you know, more conservative sign out oncocytic renal tumor, favor this or favor that, or see note and discuss your differential options. I have a whole host of subtle sort of changes in my terminology that I use on needle core biopsy. But my point is use it judiciously with immunohistochemistry and use something that you'd be comfortable with or consult with somebody or make a diagnosis that would have uh, clear implications for the patient. Are you telling you know, uh, the clinician to remove that uh, tumor or not? Are you telling him this is a benign Entity, I'm 100% sure, I don't know. Please resect it. And now uh, they can do nephron sparing surgery, partial nephrectomy, limited resections, and you may be able to establish the, 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 the diagnosis or confirm your initial diagnosis. And if you do a diagnosis, if you establish a firm diagnosis on oncocytoma in some institutions, they just follow those patients and it's not necessary to resect them. So there you go. If, if you're 100% sure, I mean, it's very difficult to be 100% sure, but if everything is classic, I would make that diagnosis in some cases on needle biopsy, yes. Well, I have to say, I have actually diagnosed it on biopsy and the reason was the same, like the clinician was following a patient uh, with a lot of com comorbidities, was preferably not gonna take the mass out and it was classic clot and I did make the, the diagnosis on a biopsy and, and with a comment that this looks like an indolent and so far the literature favors that this is an Indonesian and so on. So, um, I think we're waiting for more studies and for people to basically share their experience to see exactly, to learn more about these entities. And, you know, we believe that they have this very tight um, constellation of findings on morphology, immunohistochemistry, molecular, clinical behavior, genetics, etc. So, and most of what we have seen in a very short period supports that these uh, likely represent distinct entities. Thank you. So um, if no one has any more questions or comments, I, I would like to, before ending, just remind everyone that there's going to be a survey that will be sent out. And uh, please fill the survey to get your, your, your CPD points for the meeting. Um, and uh, th that's it for today. It was, it was such an enjoyable meeting. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, uh, my, Dr. Kirtrup, our guest speaker, and my mentor, Dr. Andy Evans, and all the other presenters. Um, and thank you all the attendees as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great uh, meeting and thank you everybody for attending and it was great seeing you guys all. Okay. Thank, thank, you. You. thank 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 you.
there is a recording. Yeah, there is a recording that will be posted um, and shared. I, I, will, I will see if it will be shared by an email, but it's definitely recorded, yes. So Rola, can you please explain uh, and repeat once again for people, how do they get CME uh, for, for this session? Uh, there is a certificate. So they have to uh, fill the survey and then the certificate will be emailed um, to everyone who, who's registered and filled the survey afterwards. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next meeting, hopefully. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thanks. Bye.